as the green transition happens in Canada, what does that mean for you as you fill up your gas tank and go about your life? Well, we're going to talk about the impacts of the so-called just transition to you and your family as well as all Canadians with our next guest, the Honourable Dan Mateague. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. As Canadians experience higher energy prices, we are experiencing the so-called green revolution. Well, this last month, the Trudeau government introduced the so-called just transition. And here, we're going to talk about what it means to you and your family and also the rest of the country. So with me here today is my guest, the Honourable Dan Mateague, to talk about this. Welcome, Dan. David, good to be here. Thanks for having me today. So, Dan, you're the, um, you've got quite a background. You were certainly a Liberal insider for years. Um, you're a, um, an 18-year veteran of the House of Commons. And you're also the president of uh, Canadians for Affordable Energy. Um, so um, as president of Canadians for Affordable Energy, can you tell us more about what that organization is? Uh, David, our organization is really founded on the idea, and we have a lot of volunteers working with us on the idea that uh, energy policy has to continue to be affordable uh, and reliable uh, and effective for most Canadians. Um, as someone who has spent a lot of time in the, the public square, uh, none of us can, but many of us do, in fact, take for granted uh, the ability for the Canadian, for the country to make ends meet. Uh, energy is very much a part of our prosperity, very much a part of our ability to, uh, to, to function as Canadians. And it's really the reasons for which civilization, not just in Canada, but around the world, has been able to grow and to prosper and to, uh, to become more dynamic uh, with longer lives, our ability to withstand changes that take place, warm or cold. Uh, but much of this uh, is a group of individuals, like-minded individuals like myself, who have decided that there needs to be a counterweight to what has been years of just one-sided view that uh, Canadian energy, fossil fuels and hydrocarbons are bad. Uh, I am not a big fan of the oil industry. They're not a big fan of mine. I predict gas prices have been doing it for a quarter century. And, um, but I have never sought out to try to destroy something that is ubiquitous. And if we look around us, mm -hmm. everything that we have yeah. is in one way or another affected positively uh, by hydrocarbons. And so when we talk affordable energy, we can't dismiss the importance, the fundamental importance of Canada's ability to harness its energy like uh, nuclear, like uh, natural gas, like propane, like oil, and uh, the derivatives of those products uh, for which the world continues to enjoy, and which Canada remarkably uh, stands as one of the most prosperous nations in the world as a result of it. So you've really done a, a big summation about why safe, affordable, reliable energy is really foundational to everything. Like, uh, it's not just to the point of filling up the, the gas tank. It's about heating your home. It's about, you know, everything we manufacture. It's, it's everything is on the table, isn't it, Dan? It is, and the revenues from it, our ability to harness it responsibly, is the reason we can pay for our hospitals, mm -hmm. why we can pay for our social programs, right. like old age care, uh, like our pensions, like our roads, like our infrastructure. It's not the direct cause of the direct effect that the, what these things can do. It's also the indirect that a lot of folks in this country take for granted. The ignorance, I call it, but it is spellbinding to see that there are many people who simply dismiss it and say we can get rid of it okay. or leave it in the ground and bury it. It's unfortunate, but it's one that we fight it. We resist all the time and we push back. We think we've got a pretty strong argument. It's called reality. I did want to transition then to, ironically, the just transition. That's what it's called. It's an interesting set of names to call um, legislation that's really setting up for an even more aggressive transition away from um, oil and gas in Canada to so-called alternative energy. So I want to dive into that. So what is the so-called just transition? I've read the bill that was introduced um, just recently in the House of Commons. Um, what is your take on it? What is the just transition? 
think it's a manifesto of wanting to be unreal and not willing to understand the world around you. Canada has already made the transition. Canada is the most diverse country in the world when it comes to energy. So whether it says you know, nuclear, my old riding, whether it's propane, whether it's natural gas, and yes, some renewables, we have it all. <laughs> so, okay. so, but Dan, you use the word trans- manifesto. What do you mean by a manifesto? Well, I think it's pretty clear that where it's coming from is the net zero fanaticism. It's one of it's just an offshoot of one of the many things. So whether it's Great Reset, Build Back Better, uh, whether it is uh, emissions caps, whether it's carbon taxes, clean yeah. fuel standard, there is a, a menu. Uh, call it a smorgasbord of ideas that emanate from you know a group of committed. Uh, green grifters uh, who believe that the country has to change to some kind of idyllic utopia for which the energy menu is not available, to Mm -hmm. which the other options simply don't work. Look, if we were to take all of Canada's energy and get rid of it and put it all in the, you know, in in the wastebasket of uh, solar, wind uh, and uh, biomass, which of course is the burning of trees, uh, we would not have the energy necessary to function as an economy, as a society. Um, and so the idea that we can somehow get rid shed jobs in the oil and gas sector is fantastically beyond comprehension. It is uh, almost maniacal in the sense that it basically says we're going to throw away the baby with the bathwater and pretend that we can use massive amounts of government money to give people jobs in the areas that haven't proven their worth. And by that, I mean, renewables are not there for prime time. They are not there to replace oil and gas and coal. They are, in fact, to supplement them. They complement them. They add to them, but they do not displace or change them. And so if we actually think we can have policies in this country that say no to the energy menu that we have in favor of a few, you know, uh, shiny examples of things that don't work, that cannot serve 40 million Mm -hmm. Canadians in some of the most inhospitable uh, climates in the world, and that's not just because it happened recently, it's always been like that, then I think we are bordering very quickly on delusion. And therefore, it is a manifesto. It is, it's it's manifestly ignorant. I, I find that fascinating. So the bottom line for you, and I don't want to put words in your mouth at all, Dan, like you've, you've um, seen everything the last several decades in terms of policy. So you've examined this piece of legislation, uh, the just transition, and you'd say it's really not grounded in reality. That's what I'm hearing you saying. It's not really based on really the importance of energy um, to our lives, but also it's not really grounded in moving forward the reality that Canada is already a diversified energy economy. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it is, David. And and it is the forcing uh, of the destruction. It's a deliberate policy to force the destruction of that which works and which will be around for a very long time in favor of something that doesn't work. When you say destruction of the economy, deliberate destruction, do you really believe that? Because everything we hear, like even the name of this legislation is the so-called just transition. It's almost like a headline from some type of of a book or movie that is all about saving this existential um, climate crisis. And, and, and honestly, I've been watching this for a long time. But the debate now internationally is really about one degree of difference in terms of the climate change agenda and one degree over 80 years. And that's juxtaposed to the reality that even if Canada shut down its entire economy tomorrow, like we cease to exist, it really wouldn't make any difference when it comes to even their own modeling. So this is like really hard, I think, for a lot of people to understand because when you when you listen to all the the narrative, the media, you think the world's coming to an end. Um, am I misreading this? Am I oversimplifying this, Dan? Well, the year 2243, 20, uh, 2243, that's 211 years from now, roughly speaking, 2244. That's when China will achieve net zero. Under the rubric, under the umbrella of net uh, net zero, you have a number of ideas, but most of which are saying we are going to dismantle that which the world needs more of, that which you cannot live and prosper without. By prosper, I mean being able to manage our lives and everything around us. Mm -hmm. It is a certificate that says we are going to cast away reality in favor of that which we know does not work. And it is literally creating a solution 
to a problem that your own policies are promoting. I sat before the House of Commons Committee uh, looking into the just transition. Amazing, no member of parliament really understood what it was. But are you really prepared to kill that which is important for your for your survival? Okay, in but order wait, to wait say, a second. Well, so you appeared we'll before a House of jobs. Commons Committee and you found um, it appeared that members did not understand what no. the so-called just transition was about. What, like, what do, you, what do you mean? Why, why would that be possible? They're the lawmakers, aren't they? <laughs> I think they're trying to define what it is. But they do know that the purpose of which is to say, here is what we're prepared to do inevitably as we go and choke the living life out of, the, uh, out of a sector that produces 20 to $30 billion net revenues. Wow. For the federal, provincial, and municipal governments. Okay. There, there is a, we're on a collision course, and this is one of the examples of where you're pushing down the accelerator, not knowing what comes around the corner. But sooner or later, you're going to hit that brick wall. Okay. And the question is, you know, will the will the fast-paced moving uh, attempt by the, those pushing this manifesto uh, be greater than the, the resistance of the wall? I think we're in for a very, very tectonic hit in this country on a scale we've never seen. And you know what? I can continue to say these things. Two years ago, if I'd said this, I'd been considered crazy. This Now people are looking at their, their bills and saying, wait a minute, I'm coming to the grocery store, I can't afford this. Yeah. Fourfold increase in uh, in people heading to uh, to to food uh, to food banks. We're seeing people who are not able to buy food, they're not able to get decent lodging because inflation is going out of control. We are creating an inflationary burden that is totally unnecessary. Yeah. Canada is clean. It demonstrates that it can, long before it was trendy, we did do things like nuclear, and we'll continue doing that, that down the road once we rid ourselves of the far left green, uh, you know, posing of ideas that I think at the end of the day are going to bring out the ruination of the country if Canadians don't wake up wow. and smart enough. And that's particularly true in cities like mine in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. Wow. So you're, you're the president of Canadians for Affordable Energy, and, and I thought of you um, the, the other month because, uh, Dan, I, I was talking with... Um, uh, a woman at uh, at my credit union, of all things, and she said, "You know, I'm going to change my job. This is my last day, David, because I've I can't afford to commute 20 minutes. Like it's just too much money. As like gas prices this other week were, I think almost two dollars a liter. It's incredible. So that that has a yep. huge hit on your on your budget." Um, and I know when we last talked, I think it was uh, in February of last year, um, the price was 1.51 cents a litre, as I recall. I don't know why I remember that number. So what is it now, Dan, and where do you anticipate this just transition to drive the price of gas and, um, say, to heat your home? What, what, what's the bottom line here, Dan? Well, the federal government and their friends in the Democratic Party want to drive up the cost to the point where you can't afford it. Well, you just uh, can't drive. Vancouver, 209.9 a liter for gasoline. 82 cents of that is taxes. And the intention is to bring that up another 60 cents a liter. So you'll have the first uh, carbon tax, which sits at about 14.31 cents a liter. You're going to move that to about 37. So roughly another 24 cents plus HST or GST, depending on where you are in the country. Call it 25, 26 cents a liter. Then you have the second carbon tax. I know some people don't like to hear that that word, but we coined it back two and a half, three years ago, and we did two studies to prove that this would, they'd be devastating and detrimental to Canadians. Mm -hmm. We were proven right on the first round. Government had to go back and redo uh, its uh, and, and change a few things, a heck of a lot of things, because they didn't do a cost-benefit analysis, but I digress. That's going to be another 30, not 17 cents. The PBO said 17 cents a litre. We said that a few years ago with the B.C. government did this you know, investigation into gas prices. And my comment was, if you take out the ability for the BC utilities to look at regulation, in other words, the clean fuel standard that exists in BC, that's where you're gonna find your 14 to 17 cents a liter. Oh, Navius and all these other smart people. Oh no, that's not true, it's only four cents a liter. Boom, four years later, Dan takes yeah. comments that there were 16 to 17 cents a liter, turns out to be remarkably prescient. So here's another one, David. It's not 17 cents a litre for the second carbon tax. It's more like 30 by 2030. So you now have 25, 26 cents a litre plus 30 cents. It's 55 plus HST. You're 60 cents a litre. Wow. So the government, not just for gasoline, but for diesel, that's the fuel that drives the economy. Yeah, right. And no amount of subsidies, 30, 50, 60, 80 billion bucks making battery plants 
to somehow upend what the United States is doing with the IRA is going to change anything because China is about to eat your lunch in a major way. They wow. got a 15 year advantage and they can produce a lot cheaper than we can. Yeah. And they own all the minerals, including here in Canada. Wow. So it, it's almost um, incomprehensible. Like this is going to impact every Canadian who drives a car, heats a home, really does anything yeah. with energy, and then all our industry. It's like a big domino effect right through the economy, right? And, and it begs the question, as you say, how are we going to compete in that kind of environment? What's the answer, like in all fairness to these green advocates? And I think all Canadians care deeply about the environment. What, what is their response? Like, how, how are we going to drive from point A to point B if our gas prices basically double over the next several years? Well, I think Canadians should be misled by the idea that somehow they are to blame for the for the for environmental issues. I think Canadians are extraordinarily responsible, but they shouldn't be snowed or conned or bamboozled into believing that somehow the solutions that the grifters are supplying or providing are some kind of balm or panacea that mm -hmm. will resolve everything. I think Canadians have to be very careful, and others we're seeing a balance. Affordability is now coming very much back into the public discourse. And politicians who are unaware of that are going to be shown the door as soon okay. as they go to the election. Okay. Now, that won't happen immediately. It won't happen overnight. But I think all the signs are there. You have an inflationary spiral created in large part by a weakness in the Canadian dollar because you don't have anything attractive that people want to buy in Canada, mm -hmm. say and accept maybe whatever the government can subsidize. And you have an inflationary fight, a, 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 you know, out of control inflationary hit. When you increase taxes by more than the rate of inflation, which the Bank of Canada says 2%, and that happens to be energy, which is everywhere, and you, you can't produce anything without it. You kind of know what's going to happen here. It's not going to get better. Inflation is going to continue. Interest rates are going to continue to go higher. The flight of the Canadian dollar will continue to be a factor. And more importantly, it's just not a great place to do and invest. And I'm not saying that because I'm happy about it. you got government saying, hey, we, the only thing that you want to invest in is companies or processes or ideas around just transition, around net zero, around carbon taxes, around carbon capture, all these other wonderful things, are the big fat amounts of government money. Sooner or later, the government's gonna run out of money and the bondholders are gonna be asking the question, especially the bond rating agencies, this is not sustainable. So you have to wake up and smell the coffee. I think Canadians who wanna be do-gooders have to recognize that. So this is a red light in your mind to not just simply the affordability of energy and the impact on people's lives. But I think there's been a lot of discussion about the just transition as well um, in many provinces, including Alberta, with, with uh, this impact on uh, the employment of workers. Can you tell us more about that? Well, I think the idea is to say basically we don't need to worry about uh, you know what will happen to Alberta, uh, Alberta workers, Saskatchewan workers, Newfoundland workers, anybody in the uh, really in the resource sector affected by this, we'll have a plan, we'll have a backup plan. We can have you do coding, we can have you do janitorial work. Look, it's not going to end very well. Let me give an example of where just transition or an idea of just transition doesn't work. We went through this in Ontario, where we had a number of coal plants shut down and we thought, well, we can just you know create opportunities by creating windmill and solar plants. All of them are bankrupt, all of them are gone. And of course, if you look at where I grew up, Oshawa, Ontario, home to at one point 8,000 workers at the General Motors plant, now resuscitated with massive amounts of federal and provincial you know, funding, maybe 2,000 jobs, 10,000, 8,000 versus 2,000. What they're proposing as an alternative is not job creation. It is, is actually a pursuit of, of, of a policy that says uh, we have to do these things. If we don't, others will beat us to the punch. In the meantime, you're getting rid of some of the most important elements for a manufacturing sector. So what does it mean for an Alberta work resource worker? Loss of a major job. Uh, the, the economy is one of the most diverse, Alberta economy and others are the most diverse in North America. They've already done the diversification. And I'm not saying patent on your head, it doesn't matter what political angle or political tribe you belong to. The reality is that there's only so much diversification. There are only so much alternative jobs. Mm -hmm. If you get rid of the engine that drives your economy and pays your bills and, and looks after people in a, in a time and environment in a world in which there is going to be more demand for Canadian oil and gas. The question is, do you want to be part of that? Wow. Or do you want to exclude yourself and try to act like the International Boy Scouts and say, well, we're too pure for this kind of stuff. We won't do it. Good luck wow. with that. Okay, so it, it sounds like the your argument is that this policy of just transition is a transition to nowhere fast. 
it's a transition over fast and it, it's in fact uh, uh you know uh, for, for those in alberta but i think for the rest of the country it's the national energy program 2.0 i've said that i've written that and i mean it if okay. you think you can have a bunch of bureaucrats who do very well don't have to worry about their next meal uh, have their big fat pensions if you think any of this can be done by trying to act as technocrats do and rebuild uh, the economy around some kind of image uh, or a manifesto that you uh, that you adhere to, you're delusional. And, and unfortunately, the country simply cannot afford to lose this critical industry. It is by far, far and away its most lucrative uh, dyna dynamo. If you get rid of that sector, you're done as a country. Wow, well said. So you're really challenging us and, and certainly decision makers to really look at these as real policies, the facts, the evidence, and ground it in the reality of, of where Canada is now in terms of both uh, energy production, but also the importance of affordable energy. And I guess what, what strikes me is, is the whole issue of facts and evidence when it comes to policy. And that is that I just finished reading uh, an interesting book by the former Minister of Finance uh, with the Liberal government, uh, Bill Morneau, and, and he yeah. spoke uh, eloquently about a number of issues, and one of which was his observation that too often the decisions being made really aren't based on policy, but rather it's based really on communications and how things look, the, the so-called optics. Is that too cynical, or, or is that what you see happening now with, with the uh, current federal government? Well, there's a prime minister who loves his socks solving and selfies now, and that's free to the image. And a lot of people with very low information, uh, you know, go along with that kind of stuff. And when, you're, when your policies fail, then trot out the abortion issue. You know, trot out, uh, uh, you know, uh, legislation around sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. Do not deal with fundamentals and facts that are before us. I think these are all distractions, and they are very much uh, useful for people who uh, don't understand how government works. But I've been around that before, and I've seen this kind of play. Um, you can only do this so often before Canadians really get fed up. That's why I think the next election may not be in any way, shape, or form even close when Canadians start to pay attention and look at how they are, um, how they are feeling today compared to where they were a few years ago. I, I, I sense that there's a, there's a movement afoot. Okay. In my old riding, Pickering, uh, where I live now here in Milton, I think people are re reaching a, a boiling point. And it's because this, we have a government that is uh, very much predicated on divide and conquer and on notions that uh, that don't work in the real world. And so when you continue to promote those things, that's great in an economy that functions well, people believe everything's just going fine. But there's an increasing number of people out there who feel dispossessed, uh, who are not being addressed, whose concerns are not being listened to, and for which your government is living uh, and promoting fantasies that are specifically pernicious to the kind of economy and country that Canada is and can become. Don't take my word for it. Talk to the number of new Canadians coming here saying this is not the dream they had hoped for. And they're packing up and going home. Wow. So in some ways, as we look for the theme of hope in all this, like these are these are difficult uh, policies that that you've argued eloquently will not serve Canadians. Is the hope that, I mean, it sounds kind of sad, but with all the pain that's happening now in the life of, of ordinary Canadians, that they'll speak up um, and... Is that where you see the hope? Well, I think the hope really rests in folks that, uh, that become engaged. Uh, they haven't been engaged in a very long time. I mean, just that those are politicians. They mm -hmm. do stupid things to begin with. You know, it's a gong show. As long as you don't affect their lives, you won't. Mm. But for every person coming out of a grocery store and looking at that bill, it's no longer a gong show. It's that the bad actors in Ottawa, fanatics, have now basically run the show and they're running the country to the ground. And they're making it impossible for Canadians to make ends meet, much less the disruption. Try to build a house in this country. Try to produce something in this country. You find it's not very uh, amenable, not in the way it was a generation ago or even 10 or 15 years ago, where there was hope and opportunity. Yes, the government was there if you needed them. But uh, if you want to make a go of it, you really could. Everything in this country that has been touched by this government and affected is no longer working the way it did before. And I believe that's... That's a consequence of a deliberate policy of uh, trying to transition to something that is far more opaque and far more dangerous and far less affordable, far less enviable uh, than where Canadians and the optimism Canadians was 10 or 15 years ago. I mean, for a government 
to increase taxes on July the 1st, Canada Day, you really have to wonder what its priorities are. Do they really dislike the country to that extent that they're willing to make life more arduous for Canadians? Or is it a joke that the rest of the country saw carbon tax increases on April the 1st? I'm not sure if there's some mocking that's going on here, but uh, this is not what I believe people that I met, good men and women who uh, donned a uniform in the Second World War and others before them and after them, meant when they wanted to sustain Canada's freedoms. Freedom has responsibility and so does policy making. And when I passed legislation in this country, I was a backbencher, probably did more than most, and that's not a, a, you know, a shout to me, it's a shout to the openness and freedoms of our mm -hmm. democratic system at a time in which parliamentarians could actually make a difference. Today, they're taught to think, to speak, and to act in a way that does not deviate from the center. So you got a handful of people running the show for Justin Trudeau, you have, you have no alternative. And you've got a buffoon in, 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 in the NDP that's willing to go along with this thing because they know they have no other choice. At the end of the day, for Canadians, will they be upset? I think they have every reason to be. And I believe the next election will be a, a transitional uh, uh, election in which this nonsense of this narrative, of this green narrative, will finally be put uh, in its proper context and defeated. Well, Dan McTeague, uh, the Honourable Dan McTeague, thank you so much for joining us uh, here today to talk about these policies and their impact on Canadians and the importance of affordable energy in your role as president as Canadians for Affordable Energy. Thank you. Thanks for allowing me the opportunity. Great to be here again, David. I hope you found our conversation to be very important. So if you do, please share it with your friends. Keep the conversation going and be sure to sign up for our newsletter and join us next week for our program. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.